am thrilled to introduce today Sonia Majola, who is coming to us from uh, the University of Colorado at Boulder. Uh, she studies gender, population, and health, and her work is mixed methods. So she's going to be talking today about some research from her new book that's out called Love, Money, and HIV, Becoming a Modern African Woman in the Age, in the age uh, or the Era of AIDS, or Age of AIDS, um, from the University of California Press. Uh, this book won the Distinguished uh, Book Award from the American Sociological Association Sex and Gender section. And um, her research beyond this book uh, explores uh, social structural processes underlying health disparities in a variety of settings. Here we'll hear about Kenya, but also her work looks at health disparities in South Africa and in Washington, D.C. Her current project, she's on a sabbatical year at the W.E.B. Du Bois Research Institute at Harvard University. And she's working on the second book project, which is Race, Health, and Inequality, Using an, an HIV Epidemic in the Shadows of the Capitol. This book uh, focuses on um, HIV epidemic in Washington, D.C., obviously, and um, the contingent roles of migration, re racial residential segregation, concentrated poverty, the drug epidemic, war on drugs, mass incarceration, and individual HIV vulnerability in the shadow of the Capitol. So uh, today, as I said, Sonia's going to be speaking about, uh, about her new book and some information on the fundamental cause theory, potentially challenges to that. So we have a uh, payment for you, our MPC <laughs> mug that you can only get by presenting here. So okay, here great. you go. Thank you very welcome, much. welcome, Sonia. I'll put my cup of water inside. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, I'm really excited to be here at the University of Minnesota and for an opportunity to talk uh, about my new book. It's always nice to have an excuse to get out of the ivory tower and, mm -hmm. and be social. Mm -hmm. I often joke that sociologists are social every five years. We <laughs> go and talk to people intensely and then we come away and write about it and uh, <laughs> occasionally talk about it. Um, so I'm first going to begin with a quote um, from Eric Peter Eckholm's book, The Picture of Health. Individuals who enjoy good health <coughs> rightly think of themselves as fortunate, but luck has little to do with the broad patterns of disease and mortality that prevail in each society. The striking variations in health conditions among countries and cultural groups reflect differences in social and physical environments. And increasingly, the forces that shape health patterns are set in motion by human activities and decisions. Indeed, in creating its way of life, each society creates its way of death. So in my book, I explore how societies produce uh, gendered life uh, and death outcomes among African youths. I'm really interested in, 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 in above and beyond individual decisions, how do societies produce vulnerability for some groups and, and protection for others? Uh, and in the process, I'll also illustrate why the HIV AIDS uh, pandemic in Africa unsettles conventional sociological wisdom about the effects of wealth, education, and health outcomes. So I'm first uh, going to give some brief background to the African HIV AIDS pandemic for those of you who are less familiar with it. I'll then talk about gender differences in HIV rates. Um, and then I'll briefly introduce what I'm calling a tale of three paradoxes, specifically the paradox of wealth, education, and employment, uh, before offering some concluding thoughts. So the HIV AIDS pandemic in Africa is now in its fourth decade. And while significant progress has been made, uh, as Michael Sidibe, the head of UNAIDS, says, the curve of the epidemic has bent, the numbers, especially for Africa, remain grim. So these statistics come from the UNAIDS 2014 report. So World AIDS Day every year, um, there's a report that gives the latest uh, statistics. Um, and of the 35 million people now living with HIV AIDS worldwide, 24.7 million uh, live in sub-Saharan Africa. And 58% of those are women. So it's now a, a, a sort of feminized uh, disease across the continent. Now, the annual incidence was 1.5 million new infections, uh, and there are 1.1 million AIDS-related deaths. 
Well, the deaths in part reflect the fact that less than half of people who need medication to prolong their lives receive access to it. Now, there's considerable variation from country to country. So some countries have much higher coverage for antiretroviral therapy that basically it's medication to prolong lives. There's no cure yet uh, for HIV. Um, and the numbers are constantly improving. So every year, this percentage uh, goes up. Um, but there's still a long way to go. Uh, and what this means is that for many Africans, HIV is, is still a death sentence. So I first became interested in gender differences in HIV rates when I came across this article several years ago in grad school. And it described the results of a representative household-based survey that found that almost 30 percent, just, just you know, take that in, 30 percent of 15 to 19 year olds and almost 40 percent of 20 to 24 year old young women were HIV positive in Kisumu, Kenya. And these rates were disproportionately higher than young men. I found the paper striking not just because of the very high HIV rates, but because the authors described people in a demographic category I inhabited at the time, young women aged 15 to 24. Indeed, the paper characterized young women in a town a half hour from where my grandmother lived and where some of my cousins lived, worked, and went to school. And that's when the problem of HIV AIDS in Africa became not just academically interesting, but also deeply personal. Um, and I think, too, I, I started off uh, trained as a, as a demographer. Um, but I think w when I first saw these numbers, I found it very hard to actually believe them, that you know, one in three young women HIV positive is, is, is kind of mind boggling. Uh, and so I first began to investigate whether this is just unique to this setting. Um, so is this gender disparity and these rates unique to this setting? And I, I found that it wasn't. In almost every survey for which there was nationally representative HIV biomarker data in Africa, young women had higher rates of HIV compared to young men. Um, so in this figure, for example, and, and this is mainly from DHS, uh, with the exception of South Africa, uh, which is from a study um, Audrey Patifor conducted there. Um, and this is just a selection of the surveys I looked at, and it illustrates not only the high burden of HIV in countries such as South Africa, which holds the world's largest HIV-positive population, so over 6 million people live with HIV in South Africa, but also the variability across countries in the size of the disparity between young men and women. So in South Africa, as you can see, 31% of women, young women aged uh, 21, are HIV-positive compared to about 5% uh, of, of, of same-aged uh, same young men. Um, so it's fi five times higher among um, same-aged young men in South Africa. But you'll notice in Zimbabwe, 15 to 19-year-old girls have only twice the rates of same-aged men, so 6% to 3%. So while on average young African women are three times more likely than young men to have HIV, this average masks widely varying levels of disproportionate risk. Uh, and indeed, this variability in youth gender disparities across the region suggests it's not merely a story of biological sex differences, but something more is at work. So for many sociologists, the classic place to start understanding the cause of health disparities is poverty or socioeconomic status. Indeed, it's something of a sociological truism influentially formalized in fundamental cause theory by Bruce Link and Joe, Joe Phelan, SCS is considered a primary cause of health outcomes because the association persists over time, even though intervening mechanisms or individual risk factors may change. It's primarily a resource-based theory. So the authors note, and I quote, the essential feature of fundamental social causes is that they involve access to resources that can be used to avoid risks or to minimize the consequences of disease once it occurs. Those who command the most resources are best able to avoid risks, diseases, and the consequences of disease. The HIV AIDS pandemic, however, seems to confound this theory. And as multiple researchers by this point have found, like um, Vinod Mishra, um, James Shelton, 
Ashley Fox, Justin Parkhurst, and their colleagues using nationally representative demographic and health survey data from several African countries. In general, wealthier people have the highest rates of HIV uh, in Africa, higher rates than, than poorer people. Uh, and this is also the case in Kenya, where wealthier men and women have the highest rates of HIV. Education is similarly puzzling with many studies across the continent finding that more educated people have higher rates of HIV. And in Kenya, in the latest survey, women with no education have the lowest rates of HIV. And finally, in Kenya, women who work outside the home have higher rates of HIV compared to those who don't. So in sum, the people with the most access to resources, wealthy, educated Africans, appear to be the most vulnerable to HIV. Uh, and I should point out that th this was also true when I simply restricted it to young women so that it's not just a story of survival, that this is also sort of, you know, that the, the youngest women age 15 to 24 for whom these findings apply. Okay, and so it was these statistical puzzles that led me to pursue a mixed methods study, not just focusing on survey analysis, but also engaging in qualitative work in a high HIV prevalence area to investigate the social structural mechanisms that were producing these really puzzling trends. So my study drew on both quantitative and qualitative data. Um, so the quantitative data comes from the Kenya Demographic and Health Surveys from 2004 and 2010. And these are nationally representative data sets in which all the men and half the women were tested for HIV. The response rates are, are really high especially in the setting I'm studying, over 90% of people uh, agreed uh, to, to, to the study. So it's, it's a fairly good, um, uh, good data set. Uh, I conducted field work among the Luo ethnic group of Nyanza province, Kenya. Uh, and this included uh, 74 individual and focus group interviews, um, as well as 20 key informant interviews. Uh, and these were conducted in English, Swahili, uh, which is a national language, as well as Luo, the ethnic group language. <laughs> Grounded theory shaped my back and forth movement between survey and fieldwork data, uh, both during data collection as well as subsequent data analysis and writing. So emergent codes in the qualitative data were explored in the quantitative data and vice versa. So for example, the gender disparity in HIV rates in the survey, which I'll show you in, in a bit, prompted focus group and individual interviews that concentrated on young men's relationships with same age partners, or lack thereof as it turned out. Uh, interview reports of an increasing number of relationships of men just out of school prompted closer survey analysis of how young men's HIV rates increase each year as they approach their late 20s. And the puzzling link between educational attainment and HIV rates revealed in survey analysis provoked a deeper qualitative exploration of what was going on in school. Like, wh what is it about um, school that isn't working? And, wh and what is it about school that, that is working? And I then triangulated the findings for the book. Um, so my approach is slightly unusual in that sense. But. So here are the prevalence rates uh, for Luo uh, Nyanza compared to, to the rest of the country. I decided to focus on this ethnic group not just because of the paper that sparked my interest. So Kisumu, uh, where I, I, I talked about those rates among young women, is the capital of Nyanza province. And the Luo, the most populous ethnic group in the province. But also because it has and has had the highest HIV rates in the country, as this figure shows. So again, really mind-boggling statistics, right? So about one in four Luo women uh, and about 18% of Luo men are HIV positive. And I should note that it's similar in the 2004 survey as well. Uh, and then if we look by province, um, about 18% um, of women, about 11% of men are HIV positive. Um, and of course, the irony of the epidemic, this side of a cure, is, is that good news means that these numbers stay the same, right? So if they go down, it means people are, people are dying, because there isn't yet uh, a cure. So uh, here's a map uh, of the setting. Kenya, Nyanza province, and the four districts in which I focused my fieldwork. I selected districts to give me geographic diversity, so north, central, and south. And Nyanza also provides an example of a province with macroeconomic elements 
common to other parts of Africa which are affected by HIV. It's a labor migrating province situated along major trading routes, including the Trans-African Highway, as well as being a port with routes to Uganda and Tanzania by water. Uh, and as I'll show toward the end of my presentation, the lake is an important part of the story. Um, so in my search for mechanisms, this appeared an ideal place to yield insights that may shed light on issues affecting young people in other parts of the continent. So I'm now going to, to tend to some findings, and I'll talk first about the paradox of wealth, then the paradox of education, and finally the paradox of employment, before offering some concluding thoughts. So first, the, the paradox of wealth, uh, what I, I call the entanglement of, of, of love and money. So I often say uh, in my class that numbers tell a story. And so at this point, I'd usually ask the class, what's the story that these numbers are, are telling? Um, uh, and, and, and what you'll notice is that some partners are more dangerous than others. So if a 15 to 19 year old girl had a relationship with a same age partner, she'd be at little to no risk for HIV. So in 2004, the comparable rate for young men was 0%. So no young man the survey had HIV. But every subsequently older partner that she had would carry substantially higher risk. So one in three potential partners um, in, you know, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the early 30s would be HIV positive. Um, now, I, sh I should note, and I always like to sort of put, put these numbers in context, um, I did some work with a, a, a former grad student, um, now assistant professor Bethany Everett, using ad health data. And we found that in the US, about 39% of women, 16% of men, have ever had a sexually transmitted infection by age 29. Okay? So this is not unusual as far as sexually transmitted infections among young people go. Right? The main difference is the primary STI in circulation uh, in this context is incurable and fatal. And the primary STIs that circulate in the US are generally curable. Right? And so, so a lot of what I do in the book is to, to try and de-exoticize the case uh, of, 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 um, of Kenya in particular, but sexualities are, uh, uh, as described in, in, in Africa more broadly, that this is not an un unusual picture if we're talking about an, a, a curable STI. Uh, and I should also note that young people were not aware of this risk environment. Uh, so I especially love, uh, there's a, a paper by Peter Beerman called, uh, and, and his uh, colleagues called Chains of Affection that maps out the sexual relationship structure of a U.S. high school, and they find that about 69% of the high school are linked in this giant sexual network, right? Or you, or you can imagine a college, you know, sort of situation where everyone's generally hooking up with everyone else, but no one is actually aware of what the bird's eye view of their sexual network or relationship structure looks like. And so similarly in this setting, young people were not aware that this was their risk environment. So they didn't know that all their partners carried higher risk in, in the case of young women. So I wanted to understand in my qualitative research the relationship dynamics that were producing these trends. So why were young women selecting all their partners? And what was keeping young men under the age of 25 safe? So first, that first question. Why were young women picking older partners? So the first reason that emerged from uh, my qualitative field works of focus groups and individual interviews was girls preferred older partners because they had freedom. And so this is what Maureen <laughs> said. Mostly people choose sugar daddies because the boyfriends, you know, they give people more stress. They'll be watching your every move. With them, they'll always be near where you are, even in the estate. They'll be seeing you, but sugar daddies, daytime, they're at work. Boys, daytime, they'll be at home. If you attempt to talk to another boy or make a relationship with another boy, he will see you and the fight will start. The sugar daddy will only see you at night or weekends or in the clubs. Right, and so this was especially significant for schoolgirls who felt that older partners were much more compatible with the pursuit of education finding them less emotionally involving than same-age boyfriends, right? And so there's a clear logic for the preference of all their partners, right? And, and, and so you can already start to see why education would be really complicated in, in, in this context. 
so a second reason why um, young women would say they picked older partners is uh, sexual experience. So as Anne noted, a young man will jump on you eight times in the night and you're not satisfied. An old man can jump on you once and you'll even be satisfied for a month. <laughs> better in bed, right? So again, clear logic for preferring older partners to, to, to the same age partner. So there's no missing discourse of desire in this setting. Um, so a final reason, uh, and a predominant reason that came up in the, in the, in the uh, qualitative interviews uh, for preferring older partners was to gain access to money and gifts. Um, so in this statement by Jacqueline, during a focus group interview, she was frank about the challenges of being a schoolgirl who wanted to look fashionable despite economic limitations in the family, as well as what she saw was an obvious solution. So Jacqueline says, you know if you're a schoolgirl, it's very hard to get money unless you're given by your parent. And let's say there's a very nice trouser you want to buy. You cannot ask your father or mother for money. Now it will force you to look for a boyfriend whose parents are a bit rich so that if you beg for something like a thousand shillings, he can easily give you so that you can go and buy that trouser that you're really in need of. But if, let's say, you're working in somebody's house, it will force you to scrub that house every morning, but at the end of the month, you only earn a hundred shillings. So if you have a boyfriend, you can earn it very easily because you only go there, do it once, then he gives you. So this statement is interesting for a number of reasons, and I'll focus on just a few. Um, First, this is not commercial sex. For Jacqueline's boyfriend, parting with $14, a lot even for someone rich, suggests that he views her with a measure of affection and offers her money as an elaborate gift. He could buy commercial sex for a fraction of the cost. And it's a gift that makes economic sense of her actions, a rich boyfriend versus a month of work, and makes her actions culturally intelligible to the focus group of her, her peers among whom she spoke. The cost-benefit analysis was clearly at work. Having sex with a boyfriend who's willing to give you money is easier than trying to earn it through difficult work for very little money. Certainly measuring a wage of 100 shillings after a month of scrubbing someone's floor compared to sex with a rich boyfriend who gives a gift of 1,000 shillings is little contest. In fact, the girl who chooses to scrub floors, a job that doesn't require a high school education, would be looked down on more than the one who chooses the quick fling and is able to show off her new pair of trousers and her generous boyfriend to her friends. Now, Jacqueline's statement would be familiar to many African scholars of young adulthood across the continent who have documented the presence and integral role of money in them. And these transactional relationships are neither commercial nor about survival. Most girls profiled a school or college going, because school is not free in many settings, and they come from families where there's basic provision of food, shelter, and clothing. And in a representative survey uh, in Kisumu, the capital city of Nyanza, Nancy Luke found that 72% of men gave almost 10% of their monthly income to their girlfriends, so non-commercial, non-marital partners. Okay, and so this suggests that men's generous provision to girlfriends is the norm, not the exception. So provision was typically in the form of cash, meals, drinks, um, gifts, transportation, and rent support. Now provision is significant not just because men often made more money than women, but because this was a primary way in which men demonstrated love, care, and concern. But this system, however, meant that many young men simply could not afford to show love. So many young men would lament, no money, no room for you. Or as Mills and Sarah Kiryanga noted of Ugandan college men, no romance without finance. <laughs> Ironically, however, this relationship logic is what kept young men safe because they couldn't afford to sustain long-term relationships with young women, many I interviewed were involuntarily abstinent or they only had hit and run is what they called one night stand sex in what they called bush hotels, right? So the bush hotel is uh, the lots of paths through the village and lots of bushes and so they'd have sex behind the bushes, right? So in the States it would be sex in the, in the back seat of the car, right? That's equivalent. You kind of... Uh, you do what you have to do, as they would say. 
um, that the probability of getting HIV per coital act or per time that someone has sex is one in a thousand. It's very hard to get HIV. And so this means it's long-term relationships where there's repeated exposure in which the greatest risk lies. I think this is one sort of misconception. Where everyone uses the condom for the one-night stand, but the danger is in the long-term relationship. Okay, and so this is why for many Africans, marriage is the biggest risk factor for HIV AIDS. So once young men got jobs and started accumulating resources, they could afford one or more girlfriends. And so this explains the large increase in HIV rates at older ages in the graph that I just showed. But all this begged a larger question for me. Why did girls want money? Right? Not just here, but in accounts of transactional relationships across the continent. So what I noticed uh, in examining historical accounts of the Lul was that ideals have become increasingly commodified over the 20th century. And the shift was fueled by the large proportion of men who migrated out of the province for work and returned with new norms for what constituted beauty. And in particular, there was a shift toward a more consumption-based form of beauty. So Shadrach Marlow, writing in the 1950s, noted, Today's Lua man looks for different things in a woman. He looks for the following. Is she brown or light-skinned? Does she look good in powder, all made up and dressed up? Is her neck long? Is she slender and looks good in clothes? Is her teeth white? So to be a beautiful Lua woman, you now need a toothpaste, skin lightening creams, makeup, and fashionable clothing, in addition to all the ideals of a long neck. And all of these products had to be purchased. So you need money to be beautiful, in, in, in other words. Um, and so it was striking how these ideals became normalized in everyday life among the Luo and captured in refrains that girls simply needed more than boys. So for example, when I asked why boys didn't have the same money concerns as girls, Maureen Riley observed, girls need a lot of things because a girl will want to dress properly. She'll want to bathe well and use good oil She'll want to have proper shoes, to be fashionable and trendy. She'll want to plait her hair, and the rest that you think a girl can use. So I think that girls need more than boys. And uh, uh, Thomas uh, said, you know, boys, they can even have three clothes, but a girl can't sit with just three clothes. Um, Onyango, another young man, said, girls love money because they can't ask their parents, but they like these small, small things like makeup. Their needs are high. So they love money to buy these small things. Uh, and so I, I really wanted to unpack, like, you know, what, what do they mean by need, right? Um, and so when I asked them what they needed, they listed things like sanitary towels, lotion or oil for skin, deodorant, powder, makeup. And it was striking to me that these are not what we might ordinarily think of as needs, like food or shelter, right? You won't die if you don't have deodorant. Right? You might smell bad, but you won't die. <laughs> it's not a need. Right? Similarly, with sanitary towels, and this, this, this is, and I imagine this will come up in the Q&A, it's not a need. I think for most women, you know, Western women are like, yo, that's a need. <laughs> right? But it's not a need um, in, the, in the survival sense. And certainly many of their parents didn't consider it a need. Okay? But what happened is um, not only do these things that they considered needs require continual replenishing, but they all get finished. You need new ones every month. But they also need, therefore, continual money, right? I have to buy this every month, so I need money every month. Um, and so once they were constructed as needs or necessities, they created compulsion. And this made sense of comments like, Helen, if the family is poor, this is a school-going girl, um, you know, as girls, we need several things. So she's not talking about food or shelter. But if the family can't provide all this, the girl will be forced to search for them somewhere else. So if the family didn't consider things like lotion or sanitary pads necessities, but a girl did, then this justified in her mind and sometimes her parents' mind a search for a rich boyfriend. But the consequence then was in this logic, providing men who are often older became constructed as a necessity. Okay, and so, uh, again, this is sort of trying to get at the logic producing um, those numbers that I, sh I showed you earlier. Okay. Beyond this, though, a larger co um, globalized cultural project was going on. 
So when I started looking cross-culturally and historically at consumption practices, it became apparent that this process was not unique to Nyanza. Indeed, a number of studies examining the early and middle part of the 20th century describe the packaging, export, and uptake of consuming femininity in several parts of the world in and outside the West, including <coughs> India, China, and South Africa. So as Weinbaum and colleagues describe, successful sale of beauty products was connected to the ideal of modern femininity that resulted in strikingly similar appearances of modern girls in the varied settings they studied. So they note a particular bundle of commodities including lipstick, nail polish, face creams and powders, skin lighteners, tanning lotions, shampoos, hair styling products, fancy soaps, perfumes, deodorants, toothpaste, cigarettes, high heel shoes, cloche hats, and fashionable sexy clothing was advertised globally. Such commodities were linked in each local context to the expression of modern femininity. Okay. So not, you know, very few uh, of us are exempt right, from this list of, of products. So as the research has found in different contexts, and as I found in this setting, girls are modern not just because of the consumption products they use, but because of Western feminine ideals that their presentation embody. So in the US, Angela McRobbie argued that women were produced as the ideal subjects of consumption in 20th century America, especially the sort of post-World War II retail um, sort of boom in the economy. Indeed, the association of women with consumption, shopping, and retail therapy right, has arguably become a kind of feminized common sense. But what has shifted, however, is the scripts that are used to bind modern femininity and consumption <coughs> together. So increasingly and more recently, this production has been enabled and facilitated by the co-optation of feminist ideals to take advantage of young women's newfound economic ability to consume in their own right. So as Anita Harris noted, the reinvention of youth citizenship as consumer power has largely been enacted through young women. Young women have become the emblem of this consumer citizen. And so Lupita Nyong'o, uh, the Oscar-winning actress and model pictured here is perhaps the most globally famous Luo girl. So in fact, her father is um, the senator of Nyanza uh, province, where, where, where I studied. Um, and so I find this ad somewhat illustrative of the dilemma faced by young Luo girls who want to look like the modern girls they saw themselves to be. Doing modernity Lupita Nyong'o's ways, it's kind of expensive, right, even if you live in the, in the States. Right? and beyond most girls' financial capacity. As such, consuming women often require providing men. So if I read the, the copy here, I don't think you can see it from here. She says, I'm proud to represent Lancome's unique vision for women and the idea that beauty should not be dictated, but should instead be an expression of a woman's freedom to be herself. Right? She's only free if she can actually afford to, <laughs> <laughs> to buy Lancome herself. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so these dynamics were exacerbated for girls pursuing education. So here I move to the paradox of education. Why don't women with more education have lower rates of, <coughs> lower, lower rates of HIV than, um, uh, why, why do women with no education have the lowest rates of HIV? Or why isn't education doing what we expect it to do when it comes to HIV? Okay, and there's a paradox here in that we know education has been extraordinarily successful in impacting women's fertility. Changes in preferences regarding the number of children to have, as well as the increased use of Western contraceptives as a means to enact these preferences are illustrations of the changed thinking, practice, and agency of educated women. So when I looked at surveys in this setting looking at knowledge about HIV, over 90% of surveyed youth knew what HIV AIDS was and how to prevent it. So school had clearly succeeded in knowledge transmission. So if education has such dramatic effects on one sexually transmitted condition, fertility, why not on HIV AIDS? So why was the knowledge about HIV AIDS translating into action, right, to prevent um, getting HIV? So the problem, I argue, was embedded in the nature and, and, and work of school. <coughs> So I remember spending several weeks trying to run, run analyses and not finding anything that sort of made me want to sort of figure out what is actually going on in school that's undermining, why, you know, why the knowledge is, is, is not actually translating into practice. 
Um, so school is an institution charged with the production of modern subjects. Further, going to school is not just about becoming modern women, but also about demonstrating this transformation through engaging in practices that mark their difference. So village girls could, could use rags during menstruation. School girls wore sanitary pads. Village girls could make their own oil for their skin. School girls bought vastly intensive care lotion, fair and lovely face cream, imperial leather soap, and makeup. So engaging in these practices, however, carried a dilemma. A schoolgirl was a girl who consumed, and consumption required money, money that in many cases they had less access to compared to men, as I show, I show in the book. And in the process of transforming traditional girls into modern schoolgirls, school also inadvertently produced consuming women. So the project of modernity, the implicit work of school, was arguably bound up with consumption, consumption that many could not afford. So what I found in school was competing normative systems, with one group of girls pursuing what they called relationships for education and avoiding um, relationships for sex, as they called them, until later. Um, uh, and so, so the mantra here, uh, and, and, and I, sh I should note if I sort of situate myself in this own analysis, when I was going to school, this was also the message I received. Stay away from boys. Boys will destroy your life. Focus on school. <laughs> Consumption later. Right? So, the, so, so, so there's a, and you'll still find this uh, if you go to sort of listen to the pep talks that teachers will give to, to school girls. Is boys will destroy your life. Stay away from them. Uh, but of course, if you don't have a boyfriend, you're not going to be getting gifts that will enable you to, 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 to buy stuff. And so it's a sort of clear choice that a girl is making to not be a consuming woman. Okay. Now, the other group of girls um, uh, profoundly skeptical that they would end up with jobs um, that enable them to consume in their own right. And so for them, um, get a providing boyfriend now, consume now, because you're unlikely to get a job that will enable you to, to, to purchase your own, to, to, to engage in your own consumption later. Um, and so a final complication I'll, I'll talk about briefly here that we don't often think about when, when we think of school as teachers. So in the district offices where I began my research, officials were concerned about teachers dying of HIV AIDS, so the government had a freeze on hiring of teachers. And so they were really concerned about how many teachers were, were dying of HIV AIDS. So when I did interviews in school, students would talk about you know, grooving with, with teachers. And so when I sort of stepped around, I'm like, oh no, this is, this is terrible. Um, no one is making the connection that teachers dying of HIV AIDS and students having relationships with teachers could actually be a really huge problem. But for some of the school girls, so some relationships were consensual, some were, were clearly coercive, at least uh, from the girls' point of view. I'm, I'm not sure they, they were um, consensual. But they were the most convenient providing men. Right? Sort of think about where you're going to find providing men in, in, in the community. Um, and so, um, yeah. So, so, so teachers are another sort of aspect of school that we don't often think about when it comes to HIV AIDS. So the final paradox then, um, and I, I developed this more in a, in a paper called Fishing in Dangerous Waters. Um, uh, but, I, but I want to talk about why women who work outside the home uh, have higher rates of HIV compared to those who don't. Because the obvious question is, well, uh, if the sort of obvious solution to consuming women's challenge is, well, why don't they just go get a job? Right, pay for their own consumption. And this was something I really wanted to explore. Um, and, and, and so the challenge of continual needs requiring consumption of modern goods seems to be for them to find or create jobs to earn their own money. Uh, but in this section, I unpack the final startling paradox and examine why women who work outside the home have higher rates of HIV compared to those who don't. And those are statistically significant differences. Um, and so my approach here will be to briefly describe a case study I conducted of a fishing economy, which was a major industry in the area to illustrate what I think was going on. So what I ended up doing was looking at it, so a major occupation in this area that employed a lot of people to figure out what are the dynamics in this industry that will be putting women working at a greater risk compared to women who don't work outside the home. So I'll first discuss the significance of ecology before illustrating the impact of gendered economies on the local sector sexual economy uh, and subsequent HIV risk. 
So this took me in a very different, um, different direction. Okay. So suggested by the map I showed you earlier, the most dominant feature of Nyanza province is Lake Victoria. And throughout my field work, as I moved between districts, I discovered how much of Luo land hugs Lake Victoria, how much life is organized around the lake, and how the lake serves as a metaphor for other social conditions. So many Luo were dependent on the lake for bathing, washing clothes, and as a source of household water, and a key occupation and major source of income, fishing. So the lake became increasingly important in the 1980s and 90s during the period of structural adjustment because of the decline of other economies in the province. So this led to limited jobs in the formal sector and increasing disillusionment about the benefits of education. So many young people and boys in particular would drop out of school to go and fish because fishing offered a clear trajectory and steady daily income. There's an almost 4% annual rate of population growth around the lake, um, as well as the growth of the fishing industry had a number of ecological consequences that resulted in significant lake pollution. So sediment runoff from soil erosion resulting in deforestation, um, so there's a demand for wood, for, for, for food preparation, and also to prepare smoking racks for fish. Factory waste dumping uh, into the lake, runoffs from fertilizers from nearby farms, all contributed to excess nutrients in the lake. So these nutrients fueled fast and disruptive growth of a water hyacinth weed, which co covered about 6,000 hectares of the Kenyan portion of the lake. So what happened then with the weed and pollution had a devastating effect on fish populations in the lake. So not, not only were fish breeding grounds destroyed by the weeds, so reducing the number and size of fish, but the toxicity of the water drove surviving fish further out into the lake in search of fresh water. So these ecological changes meant that both increased competition by fishermen for a limited number of fish and longer time on the water in search of um, migrating fish had consequences on, on HIV risk. So, so this will all collect in a bit of... Okay, so another important dimension here is that Nyanza is in fishing, many fishing communities around the world, the fishing economy is rigidly gendered. So men fish, women sell the fish. Um, and in, additionally, they didn't have access to fridges. So fishermen would typically go and fish, come home, give the fish to their wife, who would then sell the fish. Okay? But then when the ecological changes I described earlier mapped onto this gendered structure of the fishing economy, they had really devastating effects on HIV risk. So first, longer migration away from home in search of fish, lack of refrigeration, meant that they weren't returning home to their wives. They were landing on new beaches, right, because fish goes bad really quickly. So they had to find a new woman or wife to sell the fish because of the really rigid gendered structure of the economy, right? So one fisherman said, for example, let's say one who stays here, suppose he moves from this beach to another beach, he'll be having a family here, there also he has to have another family. So the language of family here underscores the non-commercial nature of many fishermen's partnerships with fisherwomen. As long as they were at a particular beach, relationships were sustained for a period of time long enough for intimacy to develop and eventually a family to be established, but also long enough for HIV transmission and acquisition to occur. However, they were also temporary enough, the HIV viral load was high enough in the newly infected partner um, to be easily spread to the next partner. The fisherman moved on to another beach or the fisherwoman began a relationship with another fisherman. So there were further implications of ecology. So first, the, as I mentioned, lake pollution had an effect on fish stock, right, in the lake, so there were fewer fish. So what started to happen was fisherwomen were competing for a limited supply of fish. So fishermen started to demand sex as leverage for who would get primary access to fish, okay? Um, and so one fisherman noted or described to me, you'll find that in the fish marketing activity, especially when the catch has gone down, We've got quite a number of ladies who are after the fish for their better mark, and that's where the story begins. So only those who could afford to be led will be having opportunities for adding to their supplies. Those who cannot be influenced will have to stay aside. That's where the major problem comes. 
So fishermen then were not only attractive as necessary in some cases as potential fishing partners, but they were also the attractive boyfriends that schoolgirls would mention. Right? They have access to daily money from the lake. And they were also in positions of sexual networks, which they were highly likely to acquire HIV, as well as transmit it to their wives and to their partners, who were schoolgirls, young women, and young widows. So it's these multiple long-term concurrent partnerships and sexual networks that are most risky in an HIV epidemic. Uh, and, and I argue, especially in the paper, that this was critical in the early years of the HIV epidemic and spreading it around the lake before it started heading to, to southern Africa. Uh, and so this really brief uh, case study illustrates why young women who didn't work outside the home, at least in the case of this industry, were safer than those who worked. Right? They were more likely to have recalibrated their needs, so they were not hostage to the constant need for money, or thus less likely to seek out rich boyfriends in the first place. So this meant they were less likely to make migrant man positioned in sexual networks of high risk. And when they found a partner, they were more likely to have bargaining power to demand safe sex or HIV testing uh, before unprotected sex would be really hard for, for fisherwomen in this setting. But by contrast, young women in relationships with fishermen boyfriends were having sex with some of the highest risk partners in this setting. They had reduced leverage to demand safe sex. In fact, um, uh, the, you know, the, 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 if they demanded condom use, a fisherman would, would simply move on to another, another partner because they didn't want to have sex uh, with condoms. Um, and they had a low likelihood of finding a monogamous fisherman boyfriend in this fishing economy. So more broadly, while there are certainly features unique to the fishing economy in Nyanza province, such as the Jaboya system or the sort of sex for fish system, gendered economies with highly skewed compensation structures favoring men are a feature of several settings across Africa where HIV prevalence is high. So studies from mining and industrial towns in southern Africa provide good examples. In several of these settings, men make substantially more money and have more stable jobs. Many, because of the long legacy of labor migration, have left their primary wives and girlfriends at home and have transactional or commercial relationships that are temporary with women in the town they're living in. So as long as gendered and sexual economies are closely linked, and as long as young women in these settings are powerfully drawn into cultures of consumption, HIV prevention strategies at the individual level encouraging abstinence, monogamy, condom use, unlikely to be successful on their own, especially if targeted at the least powerful participants in these economies, young women. So I'll just offer some concluding thoughts and, and then I look forward to um, your, your questions. So for young women then, it was not the fear of getting HIV or AIDS that drove their sexual decision making. Rather, entanglements of love and money underlay their choices of intimate relationships with the riskiest partners. And these relationships were not just about love, but they were intertwined with their transformation into consuming women who want to become beautiful and desirable. And these desires, I argue, were enabled and facilitated by young women's social structural environments. In particular, here I've described the roles of the community, school, the labor market, and the natural environment. The pursuit of modern consuming beauty was both the result of increasingly commodified ideals of beauty, as well as the explicit globalized cultivation of desire for things requiring continual consumption. These dynamics were exacerbated for girls in school, an institution whose success was demonstrated not just by good grades, but by young women whose consuming practices illustrated their transformation into modern women. Schoolgirls were wealthy enough to afford the basics for food, shelter, and education, but were also women who were powerfully drawn into the consumer economy. And this culturally driven shift toward ever-increasing consumption and the desire for things that require continual replenishing moved young women's needs beyond the ability of what most families could afford. So most young men were unemployed and therefore were unable to afford sustaining long-term relationships, leading to involuntary abstinence. So in this way, the social mechanisms for maintaining low HIV rates for young men were already in place. But once they started working and earning, becoming providing men, the risk for HIV increased. So actually, it, it switches over once you look at um, rates for men in their 30s, they have higher rates relative to women. 
So for young women living in a gendered economic context where men had greater access to income than women, without the economic infrastructures that generate equal paying jobs, consuming women will continue to be dependent on providing men with the highest rates of HIV to become modern. And I'll stop there and uh, look forward to your comments and questions. Questions or comments? Yeah. Um, I um, appreciated that in the final section of your talk, you talked about that um, women's bargaining position was so bad that they didn't have the leverage to demand mm -hmm. safe sex and common use. Mm -hmm. Could you, can you talk about um, discussion of that topic among the younger mm -hmm. school age women? Yeah. And also maybe if you if you talk to men at all in terms of their attitude for that. So first, and especially con condom use was interesting. So there were a lot of sayings about why people didn't want to use condoms. So uh, for example, they would say, you know, no one eats a uh, sweet with a wrapper on, or you know, you can't take a shower with a raincoat, uh, you know, you have to take the peel off a banana, et cetera, et cetera, uh, for why they didn't want to use condom use. So what I realized with the young people was, was it was all sort of bound up with the idea of trust. So, so in other words, if, if a boyfriend, uh, both me young men and women said this separately, that if a girlfriend demanded a condom or a boyfriend demanded a condom, then, you know, does he think I'm a prostitute? Does he think I'm sleeping around? So, in fact, not using a condom was a demonstration of trust, right? I'm literally putting my life in your hands. I trust you. I love you. Let's not use a condom. Unfortunately, that wasn't happening, you know, uh, before, after HIV testing. Uh, and I should note that this is, this is not, um, you know, in, 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 in studies in different settings, generally people don't want to use condoms, right? This, this is not unique to the settings, just dangerous when it's bound up with ideas of love and trust that, you know, why using a condom? You know, and, and, and so, so, so that was what made it very difficult to, to negotiate condom use. Um, there's a study done that, that suggested, an uh, interesting study by um, Pascaline Dupas, where she actually uh, showed girls at the table, the, the risk environment. Uh, and, and what she found was that girls were not abstaining uh, from relation, se sexual relationships. They were just switching the age of the partner. Uh, and so when they came back you know, 18 months later, they found lower pregnancies overall. But most of the pregnancies they had were with same age partners suggesting that they have more leverage um, to negotiate uh, safe sex with same age partners than they do with older partners. Um, and, and so that was the other dynamic going on. It's really hard to insist on condom use for a long period of time with a guy who's continually generous than it is with a same age guy who, who's broke, can only afford you know, one, night, one night stand sex, right? And, and, and so yeah, d does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that's pretty helpful. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I wondered about a bit about the paradox of education. Mm -hmm. You talked about this doing the school girl and how that meant doing modernity. But you seem to imply that there were actually two kinds of groups of, of girls uh -huh. in school. One group that actually did that uh -huh. and wanted to do all the consumption of modernity, and another group that was that did not, that yeah. was able, I don't know if they were able to resist or they didn't mm -hmm. buy into it or, mm -hmm. or what. And I wondered a couple things. Um, one is whether, I, I don't know what ages you were following and whether you were only looking at girls in, in secondary, which is already mm -hmm. sort of a, a, a different, a selected group of girls. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then the other is, if, do you have a sense about the proportions in these different mm -hmm. groups? Mm -hmm. So, you know, th th thanks for the question. Um, so it, when I, as I was sort of writing the book and sort of started circulating it to, to a couple of colleagues, one colleague said, you can't just explain those who do. You also have to explain those who don't. Because <laughs> even with the rates I just showed you, most people don't have HIV. Right? I think we know we often, I mean, the, the numbers are shocking enough, right? Like, God, 15% of 15 to 19-year-old girls are positive, and it goes up from there. But it means 85% are not positive. 
Um, and, and similarly with transactional relationships, a lot of surveys find large majorities of girls in sexual relationships, there is some kind of exchange going on, suggesting this is simply how relationships work. Not every girl is involved in a transactional relationship, especially in school. So it's sort of a Russian roulette, i.e. you get pregnant, you're leaving school. Um, you know, and, and, and so it was always a risk that girls were taking when, when they got involved in sexual relationships. And so part of the thing, sort of realizing that there were these competing normative systems was in, 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 in hearing these different discourses that were, were ongoing. I think all girls were under pressure to consume, but some chose to opt out. Uh, and so the two interviews that I highlight in, um, in, in, in the book are uh, girls who are out, out of school. Um, so they had just uh, graduated, or sort of the year after high school, where they were describing how they navigated through uh, high school in a, in a context where uh, there was a lot of pressure to consume. And to consume, you were essentially having to have, have relationships in order to afford consumption. Uh, and so they were the girls who, who basically <coughs> avoided consuming and, cho and chose not to have relationships until they graduated from, from, from high school. Um, so uh, I was trying to capture the, the sense that not every girl engages in transactional relationships. Not every girl is pursuing consumption. But there were clear costs for the girls who chose to, 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 to opt out of that system. Yeah, but that, that was the initial impulse. Is most people don't have HIV. <laughs> uh, but I was trying to understand what was going on for those who, those who. So you would say, what I'm taking out of this is that these, these are not two clearly delineated groups, mm -hmm. that there's a lot of overlap. Yes. And some girls end up being unlucky and getting pregnant, and some girls end up being unlucky and getting HIV, and some girls actually completely resist, but they're probably very few. Yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, or they just win the gamble. They have relationships, but they don't get HIV, and they don't get pregnant. Yeah, I think that one thing that is often missed in surveys, it's really hard to capture, is that the girls who drop out of school, because a lot of the surveys you use are not longitudinal, they're, they're cross-sectional. And so it's hard to capture the full population of girls to sort of know, are we simply capturing those who, who manage to stay? Uh, sort of a select group. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me go here and then come back. Yeah, go for it. Um, I'm wondering about whether you or the surveys that you relied on asked about same-sex relationships, mm -hmm. and particularly whether um, one factor in keeping rates low in young men might be young men resorting to relationships with other young men mm -hmm. since they can't afford to have a relationship mm -hmm. with women who are in the higher risk category. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I focused on heterosexual relationships in, 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 in my study because that the, the data suggested that was a primary way that young women were at risk. And so I didn't ask about same-sex relationships. And that's not to say that they don't exist. Um, we know that they do. In fact, they've only just recently started doing survey, studies among men who have sex with men. The rates are through the roof. They're through the roof, like in terms of HIV prevalence rates. Now, obviously, they're not random samples, the, the convenience samples, but they're nonetheless you know, suggesting that that population has been really neglected, um, both in terms of prevention, both in terms of access to, to health services, because it's still against the law uh, in many countries. And in some cases, they seem to be reinforcing uh, uh, sort of the laws are becoming even harsher, making it an even more hidden population. Um, and so I would actually expect the rates among young men to be much higher um, if they were having same-sex relationships, simply because the data suggests that their risks are actually much higher than, than they are for, for, for women. Um, so yeah, but I didn't, I didn't ask and it didn't come up in, in, the course of, in the course of my study. Thanks for that question. Yeah. Tell you, I think we have time for one more oh, no. question. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It's the hand up that went down. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Go. So um, I was wondering if um, the, the young women you interviewed were, were they going to school in their local community? Were they living with their families? Or was there, you know, I don't know, was there, were their parents aware uh -huh. of their sort of sugar daddy relationships uh -huh. and just didn't have the 
the wherewithal to give them money for makeup or mm -hmm. they you know they were off in boarding school and they had no idea or mm -hmm. so what was the context in terms of their living situation and family context so I interviewed both um, girls in school and uh, who, who were in boarding school and girls who were in day school um, and I found for both groups, I mean, the, the story of parents is very interesting. Uh, there, there seemed to be a sort of, you know, if I asked parents, I'd say, oh, no, these are terrible relationships. You know, girls shouldn't be involved in these <coughs> And everyone expressed outrage if you asked them. But then when you s s sort of looked at the dynamics, there seemed to be a sort of don't ask, don't tell policy. <laughs> right? So, so girls would say, you know, no, you know, is your dad going to ask you, you know, where you, where you got, you know, your underwear from? You know, implying that, no, of course he wouldn't. But at the same time, you know, they, were, you know, they would say, if we brought something nice that a boyfriend gave home, then there would be a lot of praise. Like, oh, this is so great. You have a great boyfriend. Because mm -hmm. parents are thinking that will be a great husband mm -hmm. who provide for you and provide, provide for the family. And so provision in a boyfriend was a good thing. Uh, in fact, the more provision, the more he loves you, the better provider is going to be when you get married. Because there's a really short gap between the age at first sex and the age at first marriage in this population. And so I was curious, you know, I, I have a section in the book where I say they know but they ignore. That the sort of, a, sort of cover story of these relationships are terrible, but in practice, uh, they served a, a, a particular purpose. Uh, and so parents are very ambivalent, and, and, the, and the students and young, young people are getting mixed messages. Thank you. Yeah. And okay. feel free to email if you have any uh, questions or comments. But thank you so much for, for coming. Thank you.